Daniel's relatives. Yeah, come up into the camera so we can see who you're playing with this morning. The Daniel's coming to us this morning from Michigan. I believe he's with his uh, brother, I think. Are they shy? D Daniel? Uh, Illinois, actually, but yeah. Um, oh, Illinois. All right. Older brother, wife of older brother, Amy, John. We can't Kat. hear you. <laughs> Not like little brother, other brother. Well, we are so thankful for you sharing music. You guys, that was awesome. We were dancing over here. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Worship with Aldersgate. We are here on the Aldersgate property in North Reading, Massachusetts. We've got musicians in Illinois. It doesn't matter because you're where you are, and that's how the world works now. Yeah. 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 And I'm excited. Today is our first 1030 service, so if you were uh, tuning in at 10 and like, where are they? Man, they're running behind. They must be having Zoom problems. We were having Zoom problems, but we were not running behind. And then the sun was different because it's half an hour later. So I know, because we're outside. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so we're here on the property with even more than two handfuls of people. I mean, man, it's like, I so can't, we're so used to a small crowd. Pat yourselves Yeah, pat yourselves on the back. Good job, guys. Yeah, probably about a dozen even people, people here. Even people who ran the marathon yesterday. We have a Boston, virtual Boston marathon runner here today. By his own two legs, he carried himself into this space. They even made like a blue and yellow arch of balloons. I saw it. I was I like saw that, it. that touch, you know, that, that nice. right there. Anyway, so here we are uh, to worship together, to uh, be together as a family in Christ, even though we are spread out all over the place. And it is possible, and we say amen. So the way the service is going to work this morning is that we are going to have um, a children's moment right in the beginning. Today, uh, we're doing a, a blessing of the backpacks, acknowledging the beginning of the school year uh, here in Massachusetts. Uh, we have a couple kids with backpacks here. Um, but for those of you who feel more comfortable at home uh, and are local, you are offered the option to drive through the church parking lot after church between 1130 and 1230 
and there's a little gift that we have for you, and I will be wearing my mask, and we can do a prayer uh, for you and your family uh, for the start of the school year. So the blessing of the backpacks is during the children's moment. Then we will hear some special music that is by an ensemble of the church, some wonderful vocals. Oh, I'm not just saying that because I helped. <laughs> it's really, I'm saying it because Johnny helped, that's why. <laughs> yeah, um, it's going to be great. Uh, and then a time of the message. The theme this morning is lifelong learning uh, because the kids are going back to school, but also we had a small group this summer um, do some studying together, and that small group is going to share what they learned um, uh, on the subject of anti-racism, and I'm really, really looking forward to it. We have some people on site here who will share, and then uh, one on Zoom coming in. And then we'll have a time for offering. There will be a link dropped into the comments uh, so that you can give online announcements and then celebration and thanks. At the very, very end, we will have a pastoral prayer. This means that you have time all during the service to write your prayer requests into the comments. Uh, we will collate those and they will be sent to us. And if we're on site at that time, you can just raise your hand and shout out if you have a prayer request, okay? Or if you are watching the Facebook Live yourselves, put it in there. That's the simplest thing to do. But you can also give me an audible. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. We have a plan. Happy birthday, Ross. By the way, I just got to yes, put that in there. Yes, Ross down in Tennessee. I saw him come in this morning. Happy birthday to you. So if you guys you. see Ross, tell him happy birthday. <laughs> if you're in Tennessee, say happy birthday. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for helping us be together through all the obstacles we have right now, God. Um, thank you for bringing us together as a church. Thanks for the people here on site and those worshiping with us at home and um, all across the country. God, I ask that you would bind us together by your Holy Spirit, especially for those who may be visiting online for the first time. God, help them to feel welcomed and included this morning. We celebrate them. God, we ask that you would help me and Sam uh, to think clearly and uh, everything to go smoothly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, you know, while we have young kids in the house, we can use them as props for church. That's what I think. That's how they feel sometimes. Yeah. Well, and Calvin has a sore throat, so he's at home. Yeah, Calvin's actually at home. Shout out to Calvin at home who's watching. So we uh, gave him homework. We said you have to watch the service and then give us feedback. Yeah, I said I want you to give us some pointers, some uh, reflections on what could be improved. So Calvin, be taking notes. So Lucy and Eva, why don't you come up and stand right behind us? Because you're in our household, you can stand nice and close. And um, why don't you go turn on that camera for Callie? Do you mind? Sure. And Callie, you can stand up in this uh, congregational camera the, so we can see you too. You want the green one? Or the uh, no, the, the tall one. Tall, camera three. Just turn it on. All right. Do you guys see yourselves in there? We've got some Eva action. And Lucy, one more time, show us the teeth. Lucy just got her braces off this week. Oh, they're glamorous. Yay. Lots of on-site applause. You got the camera on there, Sammy? And there's Callie. Callie, I love your rainbow mask. Do you want to grab your backpack? Go get your backpacks. We're blessing backpacks. <laughs> Come on. Yes. All right, here they come. So Callie, you are in middle school this year and sixth grade in North, seventh in North Andover. And when do you start school? Um, Look right at the camera right there, honey. September 16th, so this week. That's Wednesday, isn't it? Yeah, Lucy and Eva, you are freshmen and in fourth grade. And when do you start school? September 17th. September 17th, so the next day. So this is a really big week. Yeah, and does your big brother start school this week too, Callie? Yeah, he's a sophomore this year, I think. Yeah. All right, well, there, this school year is going to be one for the record books. It's going to be one that you're telling your, your grandkids about when you're older. Um, you're going to say, yeah, I remember what it was like and how they tried to make the very best plan possible for us, and this is what the plan looked like, and uh, this is how it went. Someday we'll be able to say that too. Um, but we have to be really brave, and we have to be really flexible, right? We have to sort of take a deep breath and roll with it uh, because we know that there's going to be changes, right? If there's anything we know, there's going to be a change to the plan. That's what we've learned right now. And uh, God can help us with that. God can help us to feel calm and to feel peaceful and centered by taking that deep breath and just remembering that God is with you and God surrounds you. So when you get there and it feels weird 
at school because people are wearing masks and it feels weird because you have to be distant from your friends. Or if you're sitting at home and you're online and it feels weird because your teacher's talking and you don't want to pay attention and you want to go on your game. Um, will you just remember that you can always just close your eyes and take that deep, deep breath and say, God is with me, right? And your good example is really going to help the other students in your classes, right? Because they look at you and say, you know, she's doing okay. And um, you can be a positive influence. Uh, a lot of people feel anxious and complainy right now and that, or stressed out, and that comes out in complaints and anger. Um, but I think that we can be people in our schools who help to model peace and calm and God's love. So your, your work as people who follow Jesus is extra important this year. Uh, because a lot of people are feeling pretty upset right now. So um, we have a little, we're going to do a prayer, and then I will give you a gift. Let's have a prayer. Lord God, we are sending our kids into unprecedented situations sometimes, and we're doing so with hope and with bravery and with courage and with so much um, just science and statistics and all the things that we need to keep in mind to be as safe as we absolutely can. We pray for these kids here and those who are listening. We pray for the teachers and the administrators, the bus drivers, the nurse, the custodian, every one of them, God, and just ask that you'd go with them. We ask if it's possible that this might be a very smooth and joyful start to the school year this year. God, that the, when there's bumps that you would be with folks and help them to remember that we're all doing our very best, which is all that we can do. God, we love these kids, and we ask that you would keep them and all the adults in the school safe and healthy. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, and what we have for you as a gift this year is, appropriately, a thing of Aldersgate hand sanitizer that clips onto your backpack. See that? Oh, a little clippy. And then we have, you can also put this on your backpack, a little Jesus Loves Me uh, ornament um, so that you can remember that this church in particular and also the love of God is going with you when you go to school. Do you get a red one? I know Lucy must have a red one. Did you get a red one? Okay, there, trade. And this one is for Cole as well. All right. Okay, guys, so when you see those things in your backpack, you remember me and you remember that I'm praying for you. All right. Whew. The parents are going to have to take that deep breath, too. It's like fear and trembling. A little lower, Sam, because the ladies speaking are not tall. <laughs> All right, so it is time, uh, thank you, um, it is time for our special music, looking forward to it, a beautiful, beautiful ensemble piece put together, weaved together by Daniel and the vocal musicians.
Jesus. But he winds up knocking me Special thanks to Beth Connors and Johnny Nichols for appearing on that uh, with the vocals um, and also to the Ipswich River Community Chorus that supplied the accompaniment track for that. Um, the wonderful accompanist Miles Goldberg of that um, yes. group. If you ever stop by church during the week, don't be uh, surprised that Miles is um, practicing here. Yeah, Miles is now using the Aldersgate piano as his practice space because uh, the school's closed for him. So uh, he's, that's who did that. Thank you, Miles. All right, good. It's time for the message. Um, yes, the theme is uh, lifelong learning today. Uh, we send our kids off to school. They're forced to go to school, right? You guys forced or are you happy to go to school? Which one? Uh, <laughs> how honest should we be? Right, but it's an expectation that kids are going to school and getting the fundamentals, getting the basics of education. But one of the things I really loved about Eva's teacher last year um, at the Batchelder School, Mr. Cassell, um, is that he talked about being a lifelong learner, and he gave the kids a learning license, right? You got a learning license. First it was a learning permit. Learning permit. And then when they finish, it, he gives them a learning license. Yes, so like an actual little card, right? And says, you're going to be a lifelong learner. Mr. Cassell is in his 70s, and he had to learn classroom Zoom <laughs> this year, so he was real good evidence of being willing to do lifelong learning. Um, but that, that's true about us as adults, too, that we continue to develop and grow and, and uh, learn new things and change our minds about things. Uh, we were all, you know, as a country, as a world, shocked uh, and just horrified and, you know, just um, sick at seeing the death of George Floyd uh, a number of months ago in Minneapolis. And um, I think that all of us were able to look at that and say, um, this is George Floyd who was, um, who a police officer, right, uh, suffocated him by putting his knee on George Floyd's neck until he died. Um, and we knew that something was wrong uh, wherever we stand with that, there's something wrong with that. And, and there was a group of us that said, you know, we, we want to learn more. There's something we're not understanding. There's something we need to know. Uh, and so that was the root of this. Um, we studied for 12 weeks together, 12 different readings. Um, and a couple of movies. Oh, I left my Bible. Oh, are you kidding me? Mm, you have your Bible. <laughs> this is why I'm married to Sam because he has Bibles. <laughs> Uh, but this is one of the, as we did that study, this is a dominant scripture that came to my mind. Um, why do we study the black experience in this country in particular? Uh, why do people say things like black lives matter? Um, there's been some pushback and some discussion. D don't all lives matter? God loves everybody, right? Um, why? This is why. Can I read it? Yes, please. All right. It's Matthew 18, 12 through 14. It's the parable of the lost sheep. It says... What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. Right. 
And so there's a spiritual principle there about uh, trying to reach people who don't know about God. And I think that's the first way that we understand that text. Um, but the idea of giving priority or preference or special attention uh, to the one that is in danger or uh, in harm's way or lost um, is appropriate, right? That when we're doing well, like when we're doing well, we're, um, I, just, I was just thinking about Jesus saying, you know, I was sent to the people who need me, right? Not the people who don't need me, not the people who are fine. I'm sent to heal, right? The people who are hurting. So there's a special attention that we give to folks when they're in trouble and when they hurt, and that scripture illustrates that. Another basis for this is that when we join the church, especially I know the United Methodist Church and probably many other churches, we take baptismal vows. And at our baptism, one of the things that we say yes to, if you were, or when you join the church, you may remember this or you might have been nervous and not remembered it, um, but we commit to fight evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. That's one of the things we say we're going to do. And so these are the bases for doing this type of work within the church. And as Americans, certainly, this is a profound issue. So again, over 12 weeks, we put together a curriculum. We studied all types of things. Um, I, I brought my books. Um, you want to hold that? Uh, the Ta-Nehisi Coates, Between the World and Me. We looked at White Fragility, Robin D'Angelo. Uh, we read, we did a lot of reading. Uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. Uh, we watched some movies, most recently 13th by Ava DuVernay. Uh, we looked at Selma, the uh, movie about voting rights, the winning of voting rights, um, Martin Luther King. And we started the, with the movies The Hate You Give, which is based on a book uh, that's equally excellent. Those were just some of the things. We read some articles. We read the letter from the Birmingham jail by Martin Luther King. Um, and we had a discussion every Thursday night. There's probably about between 12 and 15 different people who passed through uh, those conversations. And there was a core group that was there almost every week. And it is the core group that I have asked uh, to do some sharing. Um, and then anyone on site who happened to come into a meeting and wants to share something may also do that. We will roll with it. So a few um, of the group could not be here or on Zoom. Our friend Sarah LaMonica is not feeling well, so not able to appear on Zoom. So I have a quote from her that Sam can read as a point of sharing. So Sarah is a career educator. She taught kindergarten in town for decades. She says, I really enjoyed the readings and got so much from the discussions. I listened and listened to a new point of view. And then I shared what I learned with friends who now have a different perspective on what blacks have experienced in our country. All right. So I'm going to give you a definition quickly, and uh, Beth, you'll be queued up to come up next, just so you know to turn on your camera in just a minute. So one of these books is called um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, this one, and that was a new term to me, or relatively new, like anti-racist, sounds kind of like tough, <laughs> like anti and racist, like are two like emotionally charged things. Um, but just to define that word for us, I had to learn to define a lot of things better. Uh, that was part of my learning. Um, if you say, like, Sam, do you like a mess in our house? I can't stand messes. <laughs> okay. So um, you agree that there shouldn't be messes. I'm anti-mess. You're anti-mess. But does that mean that, that just you don't create messes? No, I actively put in energy to undo messes. That's right. That's right. Yes. So people, you know, will say, well, I'm not, I'm not racist. And I think that all, I think all of us sincerely believe that. Okay. I'm with you on that. Um, but just saying you're not racist is not enough. Right. Right. Uh, the work uh, is to clean up the messes, right. To well, do active work against the thing. And so that's why they use the term anti-racist because saying I'm not racist is sort of a neutral. I'm going to sit back over here. Right. No, I don't put crosses in people's lawns and burn them, you know. Well, or, good. Because <laughs> people go right to that version of racist, and then they realize, no, there's other more insidious, passive things that, right. yeah. But so to be anti-racist is sort of, it's an active term, right? It's a leaning forward. Yeah. It's saying, I'm going to be looking and watching and paying attention um, so that if I see systems that I need to notice, I, I will, and I can start to do some work. So that's a definition of anti-racism. It is a, a proactive noticing uh, point of view. All right, Beth, would you like to share? Sure. For, first of all, I would really like to thank Pastor Rachel 
uh, for not only leading this group, for making such great choices of materials. Um, I really enjoyed everything that um, I read. Um, value of this process for me was, was I would have to say monumental. Um, I was left with not just factual information, but feelings. My, my feelings changed during this process. And um, my empathy definitely increased and my perspective has shifted. I was always aware of the injustices of the past, um, but my perspective was that it was really only, you know, bad. There, there were always haters everywhere, but it was really only bad in the Southern states. That's how I thought about it, but I was so wrong. Um, now I'm beginning to understand through these readings about the unfair laws in this country and how segregation has negatively affected generations of black people. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a terrible sin to me. Martin Luther King said in his letter from the Birmingham jail, it is up to the moderate white people in this country to make the changes necessary. I really took that to heart. And I do believe it is up to us so that that wall of injustice that our black citizens have lived with for over 400 years comes tumbling down. Um, and I also believe that one of the silver linings of this pandemic is it has allowed us to take the time to learn, to process and to take action, to fix this once and for all, to become a true activist. And that's the message that I, I received from this study. And again, thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Beth. Hi, hi. Great thoughts, Beth. We appreciate that. Are you able to hear me? Yes. You are? OK. Here on site, not so much. All right. Uh, Lana, you're going to be coming up to a camera in just a moment. And I'm going to give you one more definition. Um, the word racist. So that's, again, Emotionally charged, and I get you. If you're feeling uncomfortable right now, fine, yes. <laughs> a lot of what we learned is to just sit in some discomfort and stay there. Um, but that word racist is like an insult. Like, to if you call somebody racist, it's very insulting and it's very upsetting. And I always thought of it as an individual term that you would use to apply, like, that person is racist, right? Um, and the shift that I've made in my mind is that racist... Nobody is racist. Like Sam says, he doesn't put crosses out in the front lawn and burn them and walk around in a white... Okay, you know, that's not the thing. It's not about an individual or a feeling that we have. When we, say, we use the word racist, we can talk about how any situation has different outcomes based on race. Okay, so situations and systems and policies are racist. Not, not, we're not talking about individuals having hate in their heart. We're talking about how the whole thing is set up. And if you can predict how people will do in that situation because of the color of their skin, that system has a racist aspect to it, right? There's a racial aspect to it. That has to do also importantly with the systems of policing. We, nowhere anywhere in our group discussions were we like anti-police. We love our policemen. We know personally the police officers in North Reading. We have family members. This is not about one individual cop, right? This is about the disproportionate effect on people based on the color of their skin by policing. Does that make sense? It's like the system, it's the whole thing. These are the police making themselves known. I don't know if you can hear sirens at home, but hi guys. We love them, we appreciate our first responders, we love what they do. Um, but somehow, when we look at the overall system, specifically right now of policing, we see different outcomes. Or the whole overall healthcare system, we see different outcomes based on race. Or the whole overall economic system, we see different outcomes based on race. And so then we have to say, well, if that's true, there's a racist aspect to it, I want to pay attention to that, and I want to work for changing those systems, uh, changing policies, which means voting, um, so that those things can be corrected, so that you will no longer be able to predict someone's life expectancy or their education or their net work worth by looking at the color of their skin. So that is how my definition or our, our understanding of the word racist shifted. Okay, so we have Lana on site. Um, there we go. And hopefully a good microphone. Yes. Get, Lana, get as close to it as you possibly can without touching it. Okay. Hi. 
Um, I joined the group after a few weeks when I uh, moved up here. And uh, I moved from a very uh, conservative southern town. And part of the reason I joined the group was to see things from a different perspective. And one thing I realized was my own personal lack of knowledge of history of black America, that you, what we weren't taught. And uh, when I uh, read the books and uh, looked at the movies, I really saw history in a different perspective and I, can feel, I could feel some of the pain that uh, occurred throughout uh, time. And, um, and then I also realized that, you know, it's not a problem in a, like, in a city or, or a, a different state or a different area in the United States. It's uh, social injustice is everywhere. And we need to look at ourselves and how we can make changes. And until white America changes, nothing's going to change. Yeah. Sam is stepping over to the mic um, and going to share a reflection from Heather. This is from Heather. She attends a different church in town, but she's good friends with us. She said, when I first started, I was confused because I thought, but things have gotten so much better for black people. We had a black president. This work helps me connect recent events of police brutality to our 400-year history of struggling with race. All right, and then Sally Meredith. Hasn't, tw hasn't 2020 been an interesting year? Uh, six months ago, an invisible, an invisible threat entered our environment. It was totally new. We had to, we were all vulnerable to it. We are all vulnerable to it. We had to come up with new ways of behaving, with new rules. We know that anytime we leave the house, we're taking a certain amount of risk. And so we have to mitigate that. We plan. We, I've got notes. We plan, we stay alert. We obey the rules. We hope we get to stay away from anybody who's having a bad day. We teach our children, especially as they start school, that we need to plan, we need to obey the rules, we need to stay alert, we need not to be impulsive because these things are dangerous to your physical health. And while most of us manage to avoid the physical risk of COVID, none of us avoids the stress of COVID. We, We've lost a lot of our favorite activities. We have to behave differently. We can't hang out with our friends. We have to hang out with our brothers and sisters and family only. And it's just something that's very different and we feel the loss and we wish it wasn't there, but it is. So we just have to deal with that reality. Is it annoying? That's an understatement. You know, sometimes I think we just feel like we want to scream. As I was going through the, the discussions and the readings for the anti-racism study, it occurred to me that our black brothers and sisters live like this all the time. There's an invisible threat in their world and through no fault of their own, they have to watch their behavior they have to plan, they have to stay alert, and they need to hope that they stay away from people who are having a bad day. They teach their children a special set of rules and tell them to follow the rules and to stay alert and not to be impulsive. And most black people manage to avoid the, physical, the, the threat physically but they don't avoid the stress 
of living in a racist society. They're always considered not the standard. The standard in our country is white, and black people apparently are aware of the fact that they are not the standard. They live with lower expectations, with lower opportunities. Uh, they live a different life than we live as white people. And while they can avoid the physical, physical harms, usually, they can't avoid the psychological harms. And this year, they also have COVID, so they get a double whammy. I've found these readings and discussions very thought-provoking. Um, I never say that I'm not a racist because I'm aware of my upbringing, and so are you because you can hear the accent. And like the accent, the racism and the attitudes change over time, and you might say get better over time. But I can't kid myself that it's entirely gone. So I found this very, very helpful, and I also find the concept of anti-racism very helpful because I can say, well, I'm a racist, but I'm an anti-racist because I'm actively working to support policies that have more just outcomes. Oh, my gosh. Mom, you crushed it. She just wrote a whole sermon. It was written just like a sermon. Did you see how she developed two parallel ideas and gave them one next? That's what a sermon. Where do I get it from? I don't know, from my mother. <laughs> she says she had to work harder than I did. Well, you crushed it, Mom. That was awesome. It's a really nice summary. Um, uh, just, just towards the end of the sharing here, I want to share with you the biggest shift that I had, um, and that is in understanding what it is to be white, because I never really thought about that. Like, you alluded to this, Mom, but white is normal, right? It's just normal. And like where I grew up outside of Chicago, it was, you know, there was all the normal people, and then we had a Chinese student, and we had a few black students, and we had a Jewish student, you know. Oh, white Christian. Oh, see how that happened. Yeah, so, you know, it's just normal. So you think, well, there's the normal people, and then there's the ethnic people. Do you want to go get ethnic food? Do I mean hamburger? No, that's normal, right? Like, this stuff is sort of built into... Um, I, it's just what I learned. I, I just learned it straight from the air in the United States. White is the norm. And Sam actually has a good illustration of that, too. So I, um, I'm half Indonesian, half American. and Half what American? Half white American. Thank you. So there's no hyphen in front of American, but you say Asian American, right? Or you say Native American or Chinese American. They all get African American. They all get hyphens, um, even though the Native Americans were here first. They still have a, like a, an additional a descriptor that goes along with it. So I'm in, um, I'm in high school. It's like freshman year. And my friend Yasmina Javad Khani from Iran, because I went to an international school. She's like, what, what are you? I said, well, I'm, I'm a human. But it comes up uh, pretty, pretty soon after someone meets me. They want to know where I'm from. And what they mean is, why is your color that color? And it's curious. And I'm happy to engage. You yeah, know. you're not bothered by it. No, people, people are just curious. They just want to know something else. I'm like, okay, sure. Especially with the last name Fisher, you can't tell. Right. Like, um, so it actually happened last night. We had friends over, and she was like, wait, how are you Indonesian if your last name is Fisher? And then right after she said it, she realized, oh, because your mom is Indonesian. Right. So it's, it's just a, a way that people are trying to have hooks and categories for the world around them. But the default category is Sam doesn't fit it. So let's right. ask him why. Right. And you usually receive that in a friendly sort of way. Like it, yeah. you're not like you're crying about it at no. all. But it's just the experience. Where are you from? And I'm probably one of the first Indonesians they've ever met. If not the first, I'm probably the most recent Indonesian they'll have met. So. <laughs> Well, and, and just to, to stick here one more second with the white being norm, also our guest last night, uh, the mom is uh, Scandinavian descent, like blonde, fair skin, blue eyes. Finland. Finland, right. Is that not Scandinavia? That's, yeah, I'm so bad at my it's math. It's specific, a specific part. Thank you. Yeah. I couldn't remember. Anyway, so that's what she looks like, right? And she doesn't have an accent when she speaks English, except very slightly. But the trick is she has, well, she has an accent that is the norm accent. And she has zero accent when she speaks Hebrew. Because, because she's Israeli. 
because she was raised in Jerusalem. But it was it was such a weird thing for me in my mind because she I'm looking at a white person who speaks English with an accent very similar to mine, but she's foreign. And the dis, the disconnect there for me was, but you look like me and you sound like me. You're normal. You must be American. Yeah. Right? Uh, do you see how I just... So anyway, it all comes together. So white being the norm, I'd never examined that very much. And corollary to that is the, is the piece on white privilege. And that's, again, there's a challenge point there. And we'd like to push back because as mostly white folks around here, we're like, hey, look, don't talk to me about privilege. I grew up poor, Right? I had, hard. Work, I had to work hard for everything I had. Are you telling me that I didn't work for what I have? Because that's what a lot of us hear when we hear this, you're privileged because you're white. It's, it's like, it feels like an insult. And I get that. Because if you hear it that way, yeah, it sure it does. But what I hadn't noticed before, if you take that idea of norm, okay, or standard, normal, acceptable, uh, dominant, if you will, um, even if you were poor growing up or now, even if you had to work hard for everything you had, every time you walk into a store, your skin is white. Every time you interacted with a police officer, your skin was white. Every time you went to pay a bill late and ask for grace, you were white. Okay? So yeah, you could have started out poor. You could have, whatever. It doesn't take away your hard work. All it's saying is that like, you have this special VIP pass that you wear on your skin. And, and we've been taught to think that it's just normal. But a lot of people don't have that pass. And so for me, like that difficult term white privilege uh, has gained some nuance and some understanding. It's not meaning that we don't work hard for what we have. It just means that there's a little grease on the wheel for us. It means we start on third base rather than the dugout, right? We're just a few steps ahead, but we never stop to notice that not everybody has that advantage, right? Maybe advantage is another Wait a advantage is a good one. Yeah. Anyway, this is not tied to white privilege, but I saw this the other day. They said, so like a, a guy says, "There's no such thing as male privilege," and then at midnight, you're like, well, "Alone, alone, right?" You're like, "Well, um, mm. yeah." There's a certain advantage that's built, and you just don't think about it. Right, right. We don't think about it, and I think that's really what it is. And Heather pointed out too, like, as as white folks, predominantly white folks, we have the we have a privilege. If we're annoyed by this subject, we can ignore it. We can say, I don't see color. It doesn't exist. Why do you talk about that? Everybody's the same to me. And we can turn it off. But if you have skin with color in it, you don't have that same privilege. You don't have the same ability to just say, I, I'm dismissing it today because it annoys me. I feel uncomfortable. Right? So I'm really proud of this group of largely women, but there are some men too, uh, for hanging in there and, and just feeling uncomfortable for like 12 weeks in a row. Right, and it's, it's hard work to do, but it's to make ourselves better and to make our country better. To make our country better and, and to be a better witness to what the kingdom of God actually is, right? Because when people say all lives matter, a lot of times that comes from a Christian perspective. Jesus died for everyone. Your skin color doesn't matter. God made everyone, all skin colors. We're all equal. We know that. That is the Christian instinct. It's just that we need to understand that that's not the experience in our country because our country's needs a lot of work on this. It's broken on this. There's, you could even say there's a lot of sin. So we, uh, we, we changed. We learned more. And it was really valuable. And I, if Dee has not dropped it in the comments already, there is a hyperlink to the reading list and watching. There were some podcasts, all sorts of things. All the resources, there's hyperlinks in there. Um, if you're interested, there's hyperlinks to Amazon if you want to order the books, like whatever. There's a lot of stuff in there. If you're like, you know, maybe I'll do that. Um, Be curious about it and learn about it. Yeah. Um, I just realized, Ruth and Dan, you're here. Did you guys want to talk? You don't have to. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I just don't want to skip you. No, no, they're feeling shy. They just showed up at church, like, innocently. And I was like, oh, do you want to talk? And they're like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So I hope if you feel challenged or upset or irritated right now, okay. Um, I think all of us went through some of that. Um, but... We just kept on taking that deep breath and saying, I'm, I'm willing to sit here and feel uncomfortable with this because uh, I want to know more because there's something really, really, really important going on right now with our country and, and I want to understand it better. Yeah, and I think that's the key. Just tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more. You know. All right. Um, yes, I think that was it. Now the sermon's over. I just give 
vir virtual visual <laughs> audible cues. <laughs> yeah. The end. All right. Um, so one more um, opportunity for putting in prayer requests, if you have them into the comments, uh, and Dee will put those together for us. Uh, it is time for the offering. There is a link in the comments that you can give online to the church if uh, this uh, morning this ministry has been a blessing to you. We appreciate your support, and we say thank you, especially to all the really consistent pledging givers of the church for your faithfulness. Um, what a wonderful way to say thank you to God for all the things that God's done in your life. So uh, that is the time of offering. Uh, announcements coming up uh, between 11.30, that's about 15 minutes from now, and noon, I will be out in the parking lot uh, with more of those little gifts for the kids for a drive-by uh, or drive-through blessing of the backpacks. So uh, please swing by. I'd love to see your face, um, or at least the part above your mask. Um, this afternoon at 2, the fall fundraising team is meeting. Uh, Tuesday night, finance committee is meeting. And next Sunday, September 20th, Zoom Sunday School will start and the first confirmation class will meet. Uh, the mentoring meetings are also getting started this week, next week, following week. Uh, we're just really excited to see what God does uh, with the kids and Christian at this year. All right, um, for celebration and thanks. Um, I think I'm gonna thank Bobby today and Wes. Um, and Cole. You wanna know something? My heart is strangely warmed right now. One of the things I love about normal, <laughs> normal church at Aldersgate is that the kids usually hang out together at the back of the church and don't pay attention. And, um, but that's great because they're having a good time. They're connecting. And we haven't been able to do that since March. And right now, I got three guys out there in the back talking to each other, not paying attention. I love oh, that. Oh, they're paying Yay! attention. They're paying attention. <laughs> it's just so good to the, see. The reason why... Oh, right. It's the reason why you can hear us is because they're, Cause they're paying doing attention. The work. They're paying all attention to the soundboard, and yeah. that's just cool. That just warms my heart. So we'll say thank you to the soundboard guys, uh, Wes Fisher, Bobby Pierce, and it looks like Cole Giles helping out too. Thanks, guys. <laughs> the sound is super complicated right now. Okay. Right, I think I got the prayer requests. So. Are there any prayer requests from the field? We got you for your marathon, buddy. Anyone else? Hmm? She's on it. Yep. Good. Thank you, Bob. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for continuing to call us your children and continuing to teach us and help us to learn more about the world as time goes by, God, and especially to learn more about you and um, more about your love for this world and how we can embody that. God, thank you for the example of Jesus who uh, noticed the ones who were hurting first, God, and let us be people who likewise uh, care and support the most vulnerable among us just as we love and care for everyone. God, we... Um, First, lift up to you, uh, before you this morning, the prayers that were not spoken aloud, the prayers that rest in our hearts. God, will you give us the eyes of faith? Will you give us hope and optimism uh, that you have heard and that you are moving in this world and that we need to wait on your timing, God? Please encourage our faith and answer our prayers. To these prayers, uh, we add prayers for those who are struggling with or in recovery from addiction and those with mental illness, depression, and anxiety. God, we ask for healing and wholeness and safety. We continue in prayer for Michael Boucher's father and ask for his recovery. We pray for those with cancer, for Barbara Schinnebarger and Carol McGillicuddy. We pray for Rob and Jill Wilkinson's health to improve and also for Sarah LaMonica's continued recovery. We continue in prayer for Marilyn Hutton's friend Priscilla with health concerns, God. We pray for Jan Condry's friend Carolyn, who just had surgery for ovarian cancer, for her healing and recovery. We pray for our businesses during this challenging time, God, and ask that you give them strength and resources. We pray for the opening of schools, for the students, teachers, and administrators, for their safety. We pray for our country's leaders, and we pray for each of us as we see the reality of racism in our country. God, finally, we pray for Bob Russo, who's having, uh, who has had or will have eye surgery. God, there's many joys among us today. Uh, we celebrate the work of everyone interacting with the public as a course of their uh, work and ask that you keep them safe. Thank you for the bravery. 
Uh, we celebrate the start of school this week and pray for students, teachers, and administrators. Uh, we have a joy God um, that Zoom Sunday School will start next week. And we celebrate with uh, Josh Giles and the Giles family, uh, Josh's run of the Boston Marathon. God, what resilience and perseverance that is to have a virtual marathon. Uh, we celebrate what the athletes were able to do and the, the inspiration that the, this gives to each of us. God, you are good to us. Uh, we ask, us, ask that you would hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. Oh, I'm so excited to see what Daniel and his household uh, do as our closer. Yeah, special thanks to Daniel's relatives for jumping in. Yeah, Daniel's relatives, that's how my kids feel all the time. You just force them, right? He's like, yeah, pretty much. All right, guys, thank you for tuning in. Uh, let's uh, listen to Daniel, and we'll give you a tour of who's here this morning on the other camera. God bless you. Yeah.